What's going on guys? I'm Ryan Morrissey with P Custom Fitness Solutions and today we're gonna to talk about cardio. So I'm gonna give you three tips that you can apply to your cardio programming as soon as tomorrow. So when we talk about cardio, we know it can be boring, we know it can be difficult, uh, we know it can be something that we cut out of our routine immediately for some of us and other people are obsessed with it. So we need kind of a balance in between. We need variation, we need some metric tracking and we just need an understanding of why we're doing certain things so we don't hurt ourselves. You know, there's risk of overtraining through cardio. There's risk of uh, chronic injuries that we hear all the time, such as shin splints, patellar tendonitis, Achilles tendonitis, things like that. So when we take a couple of these tips that I'm gonna share with you today and apply them, it can just give us the best chance of success and a return on our investment with time without our increased risk. So number one tip, we're gonna start with cross training. So when we do cardio, we think of maybe primarily running as your mode. Uh, we want to make sure that we don't fall down the path of the chronic, you know, repetitive strain on the same muscles in the same angle with a lot of volume. So when we cross train, we're, we're talking about switching modes. So if we primarily run, maybe we add a day of biking in and swap that out for a run day. We can use things like the elliptical, hill hiking, uh, rowing erg. It can be another activity that's completely different from a traditional gym cardio mode. It can be activities in your backyard. Um, it could be a, a sport or a hobby that's just gonna get your heart rate elevated for a sustained amount of time. So when we utilize those different modes, we're just giving ourselves again a, a different angle, a different stimulus to change, and we're reducing the risk of those musculoskeletal issues. We also get well-rounded adaptations. So when you're thinking about your cross-training modes, if we're doing something like running for your primary mode again, that's a lower body dominant sport or activity. If we cross train with an upper body dominant or something that's total body dominant, like let's say the rowing ergometer, right? Or you're out on a rowing shell. That's something that's gonna give you a muscular adaptation as well. Uh, and that's gonna hit total body. So it's a nice complement to running. If we're doing a sport that's uh, consistent with one pattern like biking, then maybe playing pickup basketball is a great cross training mode for that as well because we're changing planes of motion that we're working in we're uh, producing force a little faster there's a power component and a change of direction component in there that we don't get with cycling so think about which sports or activities you're going to combine to get the best effect of cross training uh, the other thing we can think about is if you're involved in a sport and that sport has uh, more dominance of your time in season, it's gonna be very specific to that sport, right? Same movement pattern. In the off season, choose some cross training when you know the movement pattern isn't as critical at that time of year. That's when you can dive into something else where there's crossover from a cardiovascular standpoint. You can get the benefit, but you're not wearing your body out with the same repetitive strain year round. All right, so our next piece that we're gonna dive into is consistency. We wanna think you know, consistency with our patterns, especially if we're struggling to get going with exercise and with cardio, before we dive into intensity. Right? We put a lot of emphasis on how hard we're sweating, how high our heart rate is, but if we can get consistent first for those of us that struggle you know, just, just staying on a game plan, we wanna make sure we build our frequency throughout the week first to get a behavior change. So for those of you that aren't doing any cardiovascular exercise, set goals first right we want to set goals weekly and then monthly and we want to build on them you know from training phase to training phase so something for a total beginner could be as simple as walking around the block you know two or three times for uh you know depending on how big your block is it could be a 10 minute 20 minute 30 minute walk and if we start with two days a week three days a week our goal for the next week is at a, a day for the following week at another day and then what we can do is increase how many times we go around that block. So we're adding our frequency first, we're building our volume in our week, and let's define that as time in the week. So if we have our seven days and we're starting out with three 30 minute walks, right, we have 90 minutes of activity in the week. Well, we wanna build that up once we get our consistency with our amount of time we're out there walking. So maybe those walks turn into 45 minutes in month two. Month three, they're 60 minute walks. So now we've gotten our consistency at lower intensity before we put any kind of emphasis on high intensity training, right? And there are a couple benefits from that. So we build aerobic endurance at lower intensities or lower heart rate ranges. 
And one of the primary uh, benefits to that is that we train our body on how to utilize the optimal fat source, or the optimal, I'm sorry, fuel source, which is fat, all right? So we all have fat on our body. We have enough energy to do, you know, a, a pretty, um, pretty high level or pretty high volume uh, amount of cardio with the fat that's on our body as a fuel source. When we exercise at a higher intensity, we wind up utilizing the carbohydrate tank, and that's limited. And it's also not optimal for rest and low intensity exercise. So if we skip, you know, right to the high intensity stuff, we bought our Peloton and we're diving into our high intensity classes first, you know, we're not gonna be able to train our body to utilize fat as fuel, and that's optimal for health and performance. And then after we do that, you know, we get the benefits of improved lactate shuttling. So lactate is a byproduct of exercise, of aerobic exercise. And that lactate accumulates as we uh, continue to exercise and exercise at a higher level. Well, we can train our body to utilize that lactate as another fuel source. So as we're making it, we can shuttle that to the brain. We can shuttle that to other muscles in different areas that need it to keep our bodies going to last longer in our cardio sessions. We also can improve our acid buffering. So we all hear or think about the burn with cardio with high intensity. So that's the buildup of hydrogen ion uh, concentration in our muscles and in our blood. And that gives us the burn. And that is what ultimately causes us to slow down or stop when we're tired. So if we exercise at our low intensity and build time and volume in a couple training blocks, then we get more and more efficient at being able to buffer that acid. So then we get into our high intensity later, we have more success in that kind of training program. All right, so this leads us to our third tip, the 80-20 rule. It's really a, a guideline or a principle to follow. When you're exercising at very limited volume in the day or in the week, it doesn't really apply. But as you start to build up more and more volume, we can easily overtrain by having our intensity just too high. So we wanna make sure that we think of 80% of the total cardiovascular training volume in our week as low intensity, and about 20% as high intensity, which we'll define in a minute. So when we exercise at a higher intensity, especially when we push that longer and longer, we wind up setting ourselves up for longer time for recovery needed. So if we wanna get more volume in, and we wanna get more benefit from our cardiovascular programming, we can't go back-to-back -back days with high intensity and run ourselves empty. We're gonna need 24 to 48 hours at least to recover from our pretty demanding sessions. So if we wanna be strategic about our programming, the days in between those high intensity days, we can get more volume as long as we keep the intensity low. So think, you know, the ability to have a conversation, or if you're tracking your heart rate, it's in zone one and zone two. We'll talk about that in a second. So that's following the 80-20 rule, all right? Now we've got a little bit of leeway either way, but we don't wanna get hung up in a 50-50 split or a 75-25 split the opposite way. We're gonna set ourselves up for overtraining. We're also gonna plateau. We're just not gonna see uh, development in our cardiovascular programming, all right? And our aerobic adaptation, as I mentioned earlier, helps us exercise at the high intensity, right? It does two things. Our high intensity days, we're usually doing intervals. We're not just holding a high intensity because we really can't. So when we're doing our intervals, if we're not in shape with our cardio base or our endurance already, then we wind up completing one, two, three intervals and then we're smashed and we have to quit. If we have really good aerobic endurance, we're able to add more and more intervals onto that program and we get way more bang for the buck if we can add you know, our, our total volume of intensity for that day. And then our, our recovery between intervals is greatly improved. So if we're efficient aerobically, then we'll see a quick recovery between intervals. We'll see our heart rate drop much faster and we can pack in more in, into that workout and actually stick with the target intensity for each of those intervals that we're looking to hit. All right, so let's define intensity. So if we're looking at uh, an RPE scale, which we can use, that's rate of perceived exertion, right? Let's take one to 10. Think of low intensity or your 80% as five and lower. So that can be something that's uh, really easy, like a walk. Um, it can be, for some people that are in shape, that can be a, a steady state run. But that run, during that run, you should be able to have a full conversation with the person next to you. You should also be able to inhale through your nose. And those are two with just quick checks to do without any kind of data or any kind of other metrics. If we're talking heart rate zones, these are zone one and zone two. All right, 
So we want easy to moderate to make up 80% of the workout. When we get into heart rate zone three and four, that's where we have prolonged recovery needed. And then zone five and up, we wind up going, as we hear, anaerobic, right? So we can't meet the demand of exercise. There's not enough oxygen to do so. So we use another energy system to do that. And that takes a long time to recover from. So those are the workouts that are gonna beat you down. So again, 80% we wanna think of as zone one, zone two, or our you know, three, four, five on an RPE scale of one to 10. When we get above the six, that's when we need to just respect those workouts and understand that we need more time to recover, okay? All right, if this information was valuable to you, please hit like, subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's more to come. We're gonna be following up with additional videos on a bunch of different topics from training to nutrition uh, to injury prevention and so forth. All right, if you need assistance in your cardio programming and you're looking for you know, customized solutions, you wanna track metrics, you want your heart rate zone set up and ongoing coaching, we offer virtual coaching on a number of different platforms where we can handle that. So reach out to us if you need help. Look forward to talking with you. Have a great day. Hope you got something out of it.